All right, so thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon for our University of Maryland Baltimore ITE Center Seed Grant Symposium. This annual event allows us to hear about the good work that has been that is being done by faculty and staff with students here at the University of Maryland Baltimore. And on behalf of Heather Congdon, Joseph Martinez and myself as the center's co-directors, we are grateful for the work that you're doing. In addition, we want to acknowledge the work of Rita Gash, who is our staff support person who makes many things happen on our behalf. With that, I have the pleasure of introducing our president, Bruce Jarrell, who will bring greetings, and we are most appreciative of his ongoing support of IPE at UMB. Dr. Jarrell? You're muted, Bruce. Oh, well, everybody got muted. Uh, thank you all, and it's a pleasure to be here. I did have a question for Dean Kersling. I didn't know they did tape recording anymore. Do they still do tape recording? Well, they do recording, and I don't think it comes out on a tape, but you are da you are dating me to a, a younger point in my life. I'm sorry to do that. I didn't mean to do that. I, I want to start by thanking Dean Kersling, as well as Dr. Condon and Martinez, uh, for leading this IPE effort. I remember when we recruited uh, Jane to come to uh, UMB, one of the things that she insisted on was being able to lead this program. And of course, you know, at the time, uh, Dr. Perman, President Perman, it warmed his heart because this is an area that was always very close to uh, to him, for me as a, a prior transplant surgeon, uh, interprofessional care of the patients was the only way you took care of them. And, and so having that as part of our learning objective is really important to me. Uh, you, you have a great slate today. I'm glad that you all have competed and now executed the seed grant uh, programs. One of the nicest part about them is when you look through the different topics, one, it's a variety of topics, but two, in, it, in every one of them, there's at least several schools represented. So I think we've accomplished our, our goal. Uh, I look forward very much to hearing the uh, conversations. I'll be in and out, but I hope to stay during the entire thing if I can. Uh, so Dean Kersling, I shall turn it back to you. Thank you all very much for being here. So with that, we're very pleased to introduce the first presenter, Dr. Kimberly Clays, who is going to be talking about gamification and how to use it to enhance the learning of interprofessional antimicrobial management. Hello, uh, it's okay if I start sharing my screen with everyone? Absolutely, please do. Okay, thank you for the introduction. And yes, our um, interprofessional project was using gamification to enhance learning of interprofessional antimicrobial management. So the just use of antibiotics is really the responsibility of all healthcare workers. We're moving from uh, an antibiotic era to a post-antibiotic era where we don't ask which antibiotics we should be using, but do we even have an antibiotic that will cover it? As such, antimicrobial stewardship has become critically important and learning about the, the, excuse me, the judicious use of antimicrobials is key. And one important thing about antimicrobial stewardship is as I mentioned, it's the responsibility of all healthcare workers, and it is inherently interprofessional in nature. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, as part of their core elements for antimicrobial stewardship programs, highlight that, that interprofessional need. But not just pharmacists, but physicians, nurses, microbiologists, information technologi technologists, all play a role in making sure antibiotics are used properly. So it really is essential that our future healthcare workers whether it be from the School of Pharmacy, School of Medicine, or the Doctor of Nurse Practice uh, program, have a strong foundation in antimicrobial spectrum of activity. So as healthcare professionals across all settings, we have this responsibility to be antimicrobial stewards. However, studies have shown that student knowledge on basic antimicrobial concepts, such as spectrum of activity, mechanisms of resistance, and ADR avo avoidance, tend to be poor, and that's a self-perceived uh, competency as well, and that impacts their ability to effectively streamline antibiotics and avoid ADRs in these patients. So previous studies have shown about only two-thirds of pharmacy students and even one-third of medicine students feel that their education prepared them for the responsibility of being antimicrobial stewards. And that's really not just limited to say, us here at University of Maryland. These are studies that have come across 
across the United States. And really one of the problems is the core foundation of being able to streamline antibiotics comes down to having a very solid foundation and spectrum of activity, which often involves very boring root memorization. Um, and that's something that I think we don't do a good job of really providing them enough time with, but also making it interactive for them because it is an extremely difficult part of the curriculum that often can be kind of brushed under the rug. Um, you can go through ID and, and still do really well in the courses, but still not have that core foundation. Thinking about how do we get students in these different health professions more engaged, thinking about antimicrobial spectrum of activity, we, we do different activities with them. Uh, we can ask them to build bug drug tables. There's very there's different charts we can make them do, but we need to make them feel a bit more engaged too. So these are just some examples of different publications that have come out looking at how do we actively engage students in these core concepts of antimicrobial sector of activity. And one of the things that we were thinking about here at Maryland is the fact that really at this point in time, our students really are born into a time where computers and technology are ubiquitous and familiar. And it really is up to us to move beyond just traditional PowerPoint based lectures as their preferred learning strategy has evolved and become more interactive and dynamic. And since students have, have uh, changed how they're learning, we need to adapt how we do our teaching. And currently there's a bunch of different apps that focus on infectious diseases and help students with learning. Um, some of them more interactive than others, most of them not really focusing on that core bug drug principles. Um, some of these might be familiar to some any, people on the call, but this visual learning tool such as Sketchy Medical um, that often gets used by med students for um, storytelling, for retention of learning. There's the CDC's Solve the Outbreak or uh, Stanford Sceptris to help treat patients with sepsis. The um, interesting about, thing about these is that, again, they don't really focus on the core principles of antibiotic spectrum of activity. They're a little bit above that. And they have varying degrees of interactivity and also varying degrees of cost. Uh, so an individual subscription to some of these services could be 150 to 150 annually. Um, so we know that digital learning technologies are in demand and there's opportunities for future development. Um, so with that, our idea was to build an effective and sustainable relationship between the schools of pharmacy, medicine, and nursing in order to improve interprofessional education and knowledge as it pertains to antibiotics and their spectrum of activity. And to do this, we decided to develop a phone-based app that's interactive and will combine creativity of a type of game like Angry Birds, which he was on the screen earlier, but he flew off instead of on, and then the intellectual content uh, that we are looking for in the actual course curriculum. We want to make sure it's engaging our students effectively and teaching them those concepts that otherwise just involve a lot of root memorization, but are key to the uh, foundation of knowledge. So this project that we, de we did, um, Basically, I wanted to go through the various steps and where we started to where we are. Um, I'm going to go through these in, various, in detail in the next few slides. We performed focus groups at all three schools. We identified an app developer. We did some alpha testing for functionality. Then we did some beta testing for student feedback. And, we, and then I'll show you a little some screenshots of the app that we have so far disseminated. So for the first part, the focus groups. So the study team, uh, members conducted focus groups with it, multiple separate groups of medical, pharmacy, and nurse practitioner students to look, look at learning strategies, as well as what types of apps they're using on their phones, um, and how much they'd be willing to pay for an interactive app that would help them with learning antibiotic spectrum of activity. So first question, like going through these quickly, obviously we wanted to assess their overall confidence with antibiotic spectrum of activity. We wanted to look at their learning types, um, which we have here in this table, and they can be a mix, so they can be either fully sensory or fully intuitive or a mix, visual, verbal, active, reflective, sequential, global, and so on. And then what types of games they play on their phone to help gear us to how we wanted to make something uh, for an app, like what type of game we wanted to put in there that might be most appealing to students. And then a couple more questions about how often we think they'd use it and how much they'd be willing to pay for an interactive app like that were asked. Um, so in general, we had 58 respondents um, from the three schools. Overall, the knowledge and comfort with ID was 
around the median of three, which is kind of what you expect, especially based on previous literature. It's okay but not feeling overly confident. The, those common types of learners, um, they were more sensory, they preferred concrete practical examples. Uh, they're more visual, they preferred pictures, graphs, and diagrams, more active. They liked problem solving and working in groups and sequential, preferring information presented in a linear, linear and orderly manner. And what we also found by talking to these different groups is that the pharmacy students were more interested in competitive-based games, where the medical students and nurse practitioner students were really for competitive games were more interested in independent activities. And then um, there also was a uh, preference for uh, different types of, uh, sorry, lost my train of thought. There's also preference for different types of motivations inside the game, such as like badges and things like that. Um, willingness to pay was about $1 for an app, which, you know, I guess that makes sense. Usually when you have a phone-based app, you're not paying too much for it. It's usually a buck or two if it's, it's not free. The types, of, the types of games played on their phone, most common strategy and puzzle were very common. Um, and so we took this information and kind of put it together to think about what we want our app to look like. Um, that obviously, I think, was the easiest part. Um, the next part came to finding an app developer and doing the alpha testing. And finding an app developer was actually probably one of the hardest parts because you need to find someone not only with the programming skill, obviously, but experience with gamification and really experience with gamification related to the medical field. So they had a better understanding and ability to work with us. And then the biggest hurdle was understanding our limited budget. Um, between the seed grants and some internal funding, we, were very, we had a budget of around a little under $60,000, which we thought would be good for an app, but none of us had made apps before. So we learned very quickly that that's not much for an app. Um, we developed a list of app requirements and specifications, a wish list based off of what we learned from our students. And then we had to whittle away at that. We did a, we looked at our wish list and we did gives and takes with the app developer for what we could actually end up doing. We had a kind of a draft mode here that kind of let us put together a, a very simplified type of game that would allow students to kind of work through some memorization without just looking at flashcards. This involved also developing initial very rich database of drug bug facts that the faculty um, at the School of Pharmacy uh, made and maintains. And then obviously we were involved in kind of assessing the overall experience moving forward. Um, what we ended up doing through many, many meetings, uh, because honestly the most of our work was trying to develop this app and work with the developer within the confines of our budget. Uh, so I'm skipping through months and months of stuff, but in the end, we ended up with something called Microbe Master. It's now disseminated through um, the App Store, and you can find it by just typing Microbe Master. And this is just a little presentation of what it actually looks like if you were to pull it up on your phone. Um, there, what we ended up doing, and I'll show you a bit here, you can see we've got three different levels. We wanted to make it a little bit more than just a basic like click on some questions, get some answers quiz type thing. So we put some levels in there to help them build up knowledge. First level was gonna be your simple, what kind of bacteria are these? Are these gram positives or these gram negatives? Really the cores of microbiology that the antimicrobial uh, spectrum of activity rests on. And then building up the levels to more complex bugs and drugs questions. What kind of drugs cover which kind of bugs? Some basic principles at level two and some higher level concepts at level three. So they would work through these different levels, answering questions such as the one you see in the middle slide here and getting a little bit of feedback about which one's the correct answer. As they did through more of these, they get their own stats. Uh, we had the leaderboard in here, we have the total points. And in the bottom here, this is actually badges, it's cut off, but there's various different badges they could earn as they continue to play, just to give them a little bit more interactivity, more like, uh, feedback that you get from something like a duo lingo and whatnot. So the badges are just there to help motivate them to keep going. Uh, so that led to our beta testing, MicroMaster app with classes with second year pharmacy students during their core infectious diseases therapeutics class. Uh, they were given pre and post assessments of bug drug knowledge, as well as a survey about how the app helped them reinforce the sector of activity material. Uh, what we found was, and maybe this is because we were giving them the app and asked them if they liked it. Most of them said they did like it. Um, they found that it was helpful 
to actually learning spectrum of activity. The other useful feedback we got was um, that it would be better with a bit more teach back information in there instead of just what the correct answer is and things like that. So giving a little bit more direct feedback for each thing. And then uh, also if we could maybe give them different amounts of time because it was a time-based quiz uh, uh, questions on the app. Most of them did also agree that um, the micro master, they'd recommend it to future students to use to help as a learning tool. You know, they did give us some useful feedback about um, whether the functionality of the app, which is definitely still something that as a beta app was um, being worked on. And that's why we wanted to beta test it with them. And we did work with the app developers to try and fix some of those snags of the students brought up again within the confines of our budget. So the current status, this micro master was implemented within the School of Pharmacy's ID curriculum uh, as a study aid. It is uh, available on the App Store. The biggest issue we've had is funding. Uh, when we started this, we naively thought our budget would be appropriate for a simple app. We, did, we found out our budget was probably one third of what you need for even a simple app, let alone maintaining the uh, app and maintaining the um, uh, software that even the app runs on. So we are kind of, we've learned a lot from this experience, but we still, we just are stuck right now with where we can go with our app right as of now. So ending on a bit of a low note, but that's kind of where we were with this experience and with what we've been able to do. Um, but with that, I can take any questions. So thank you so much for the work and for your presentation. This is Jane. If people have questions, if you could unmute yourself, that would be great. Or if you prefer to just put them in the chat box, I can monitor that and then ask the questions. In terms Dave, of, Dave yeah, Kirk, go ahead. this is Mark Reynolds. I, I want to applaud the group. That was an outstanding uh, a program in the in the software development. I, I am very interested in in how you view this with respect to application. Meaning, do you see this? How do you see this fitting within the educational forum for students? For ideally, and um, ideally, what I see. For students is that it is just a study aid that we make available to them. Um, one of the things that we've noticed with spectrum of activity is it, with that root memorization, it, they need to go through and practice it a lot to really get it because there's not a lot that you can tell them about the spectrum of activity that is just understanding basis root memorization. So it's one of the things we want to do is have an app that while they're maybe like on the bus going to school or kind of in between things, they can just play on it for a bit to get a little bit more reinforcement of that learning. So really it's just a tool that's available to them to help reinforce that core curriculum that is being taught. Does that answer your question? It, it does, thank you. In fact, it's the core curriculum that's often incorporated in licensure and boarding examinations. And that's where I, I could see you taking this and not only using it as an adjunct in the educational process, but focusing it to prepare graduates um, for examinations after their their program. Yeah, I agree. It's one of the things that we I've learned uh, since becoming faculty is like the core principles, the spectrum of activity. You, you think that they are pretty simple, like MRSA doesn't get covered by this or Student months doesn't get covered by that, and you go back and you find your fourth year students preparing for their boards don't even have that knowledge, and you're like, I I thought we spent so much time on this. Right. So, uh, <laughs> thank you, President Jarrow. Thank you, President Jarrow. Yeah, Kimberly, I enjoyed your talk as well. Uh, just one sort of general comment, not related to your specific project. We have stood up a number of of competitions. Uh, with the College Park uh, undergraduates to create apps. Uh, it's, it's been inexpensive. They've been extremely creative. Uh, and, and so I would say for the future, if we have some of these things, I would consider that uh, uh, pathway for the current one. It is even conceivable uh, we could get this to Dr. Lacasio, who's the vice president for research for the two universities, 
and maybe she could get some students to be particularly pre-med, pre-nursing, pre-pharmacy, pre-dentistry interested in this uh, and maybe carry it forward to a next level. So that is an option that you might want to pursue. That is, thank you. That is a great option. I think what we've learned through this is that those types of resources to have students that have that kind of background and program is really what we need to make this go through. And that's, that's excellent. Thank you so much for that option. That's what they got down at that campus, a whole bunch of those people. Thank you. I def will definitely uh, want to touch base on that afterwards. Thank you so much. So, and there's a nice note in the chat box about your app has already been downloaded and somebody's going to be using it soon to study. So, oh, thank you. I'm put the headphones in. Sorry, baby. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much to everyone and for your for the work that your group did and the work that's still to come. Uh, our next presentation will be given by Dr. G Name, who and she'll be talking about interprofessional care for head and neck radiation patients. Hello, everyone. I'm going to start sharing my uh, screen. Okay. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to first get the grant uh, for our group and to present to you about the interprofessional care of head and neck cancer patients. It's a topic that's pretty near and dear to, to my heart. Um, head and neck cancer is not one of the most prevalent cancers, but it's one of the most debilitating uh, for patients. Uh, the American Cancer uh, Organization uh, estimated around 53,000 oral cancer cases in 2020, with about 10,750 um, dying because of their disease. Even with our um, pretty high mortality, you see that with the improvement in, in our surgical skill and you know, medical oncology, radiation oncology, uh, if we kind of start comparing survival from the 70s to even 2015, we have improvements and we also have improvements uh, if we kind of jump the five years into 2020, um, which really means that those head and neck cancer patients are going to be, are going to survive longer and um, require prolonged care, uh, especially uh, dental care as uh, effects of their uh, management of their cancer kind of is pretty long reaching. Uh, most uh, patients that face uh, head and neck cancer, uh, they end up going through uh, surgical management, combination of surgery and radiation, and sometimes based on the staging to uh, chemotherapy also. The treatment itself leaves them with pretty uh, significant um, quality of life deficits. Uh, surgeries usually leave them with deficits in speech, in mastication, uh, pretty uh, strong stigma in aesthetics that cannot be hidden. You can usually easily tell a head and neck cancer survivor. Uh, radiation that helps prolong their life and improve their prognosis also um, ends up adding to their uh, issues of quality of life by a severe um, dryness that leaves them with a much higher caries risk. Uh, some of them develop prolonged issues with swallowing that makes them peg dependent. Um, and one of the most serious um, side effects that we see and we face as dentists um, is the management and the prevention of uh, osteomedia necrosis, which can happen if these head and neck cancer patients do not uh, get the proper pre-radiation exam and in clearance and proper treatment post-radiation. Uh, and this kind of is not only just in kind of the, I wouldn't say the burden, but the responsibility of the dentist, but it's also a multidisciplinary from, you know, the radiation oncologist to the uh, nurse practitioners that care for them in survivorship clinics. We need to make sure that we have good awareness of these sequela and their effect on the uh, oral health and the steps that we need to do to prevent uh, something so drastic as the in necrosis of the bone that in a lot of uh, cases ends up uh, requiring further surgery, further uh, um, ICU stays, and, and prolonged uh, care. So with 
simple identification and, and, and proper management, we can avoid uh, these reconstructive surgeries. Uh, in general, uh, head and neck cancer patients, uh, they kind of face a lot of barriers. Uh, lack of trained providers, especially I speak for our field in dentistry, uh, most of the patients that I see tell me that most dentists are scared to manage them. Most dentists are not comfortable. The minute that they told, tell, they, uh, you know, in the form of their medical history of having uh, head and neck cancer, they're kind of hands off and, and, and not comfortable in caring for them. Um, another big issue is cost of care and limited insurance coverage, and also the limited patient income, which doesn't allow them to get the proper care that they need. So keeping all of this in mind, in 2018, uh, when I joined as a full-time faculty uh, at the dental school, um, I was able to set up a little dental oncology clinic to care for patients, which were mostly referred from the radiation uh, group across the street uh, at uh, the Greenbaum Cancer Center, so we can do clearance for these patients and manage them. Uh, we would do a lot of the pre-radiation care and post-radiation care. And the post-radiation uh, care was the one that's most significant because we would see a lot of patients with a lot of complications that could have been easily managed if they would have had a, a pre-radiation check. And we were able to build up over the uh, past three years uh, our patients to, uh, patient pool to 191 patients. Our general patient demographic uh, is kind of pretty varying, but the one thing that I kind of want to uh, stress here that most of the patients that we see have absolutely no insurance coverage. Uh, so they rely heavily on having clinics like ours to be able to um, provide them the care that's necessary. So uh, we went ahead and applied for the IPEC grant that we thankfully uh, did get, and the purpose of our grant uh, was to train nurse practitioner students and dental students in comprehensive care of head and neck cancer patients. Uh, these patients are not kind of a, a get a treatment and you're done. They need prolonged uh, care and prolonged uh, uh, management, not only on the dental aspect, but also onto the medical aspect. Most uh, survivorship clinics are managed and run by nurse practitioner uh, students, I mean, sorry, nurse practitioners, um, and uh, it, it's very important for us to get our colleagues to be very comfortable to look into the mouth and to kind of identify um, issues and identify how to refer them to us and how we can provide the best care for our patients. And hopefully with that, to be able to address disparity in care for those head and cancer patients. So what we were able to set up, we set up a, a weekly rotation. Uh, the students that saw patients with us were uh, two groups. We have our dental uh, students, our senior uh, dental students, which are part of the oral surgery clerkship. And they uh, dedicated three sessions in, the, in uh, our oral surgery department with one specific to uh, managing head and neck cancer patients. We also had our nurse practitioner students spend uh, two sessions uh, a week with us. Uh, their typical day would be to start with the dental oncology so that they would see what we do with the patients in terms of pre-radiation and post-radiation examination, um, what we educate the you know, patient's education on what they can and cannot do, preventive uh, measurements, uh, things that we know would help reduce the risk of uh, something so drastic as osteoradionecrosis. Once they are Done with us, they moved on to spend time with the uh, radiation oncology team across the street at the hospital where they were able to see two portions. They were able to see patients that are preparing for radiation and patients coming back for follow-up. And we ended the day for them by joining the tumor board, which included the surgical providers, the radiation oncology teams, the medical oncology teams, and of course, pathology and radiology. And our goal was to show them how uh, multidisciplinary it is to care for these patients, to try and show them the different aspects of their care and the fact that their care doesn't end with that uh, first phase of treatment and, and, and getting the, the uh, cancer under control, it's really a lifelong disease that we have to monitor and manage for them. So after completion of their rotation, which was a full year rotation, we have them complete a uh, 
Spice Our Instruments survey to see how did they enjoy it? Did they kind of get what we were trying to do in terms of training them to uh, be able to provide multidisciplinary care and, and provide those patients with the care that they need? Most of our responses were extremely positive. Um, in general, when we when we asked them about working with other students from other health profession, um, it, whether that enhanced their education, the response was mostly positive. About Eighty percent agreed uh, or strongly agreed that this is something that is very helpful in uh, in their education. Uh, when we asked them about um, whether they felt that their role within the interprofessional healthcare team is clearly defined. Again, they, we had a positive response from them. I feel that um, fostering a multidisciplinary care and multidisciplinary uh, aspect of managing those patients uh, and having our students exposed to it so early in their training and not just when they graduate uh, kind of helps reinforce and, and will help them identify their roles better in the care of those patients. Uh, when we asked them about their um, whether the they perceived that the health um, outcome of those patients was improved by uh, a team approach of uh, of them um, of their care, again we had an outstanding response of them really identifying the improvement in the care of these patients by having a uh, multidisciplinary approach. Uh, we also asked them about uh, if they perceive that the patient satisfaction is improved uh, when patients are treated by a team. And again, uh, they mostly felt that, yes, they did feel that it, it improved the patient care. Um, whether participating in educational experience with students from another health profession enhances their future ability. Um, again, we had a, a good response to it. Uh, I feel that probably the more we do programs like this and, and kind of are able to um, organize it more for them, they will uh, enjoy and they will be able to identify their roles in care uh, even more. Um, when asked about the uh, all health professional students should be educated in establishing uh, a collaborative relationship with members of other health professions. Again, they mostly strongly agreed uh, based on our experience with the, with the nurse practitioner students and dental students. And um, the one that I feel like we have more to work on is when we look at whether they understood their role uh, in kind of that multidisciplinary uh, approach, they, I didn't get that strongly agree that I got where they really felt that the patients were doing better. They really felt that we were providing patients with uh, with better care, but they still felt a little lost in in where they stand in the in their care. Uh, and I think again, the more we have a multidisciplinary, more programs of incorporating their clinical experience to not just have our dental students focus only on uh, the, on dentistry and the nurse practitioner students only on their hospital-based training, and of course, medical students, trying to integrate um, the, the different professions would really help in afterwards, once they graduate, to be able to identify where their role is and what how they can improve patient care. And when asked about the health uh, professional, a health professional should collaborate on interprofessional teams. Again, they identify that this is something that's good. They they know that it's something that's that's beneficial to patients, but they still are kind of unsure of their role of, uh, in it. Uh, when asked about their clinical rotation, uh, rotations are ideal place within their respective curricula for health uh, professional students to interact. Again, we had a positive feedback, which shows that our students would enjoy having, uh, you know, different uh, specialties or different training fields uh, um, working together to care for patients. And I know we focus on um, cancer patients uh, in the dental oncology clinic at the dental school, but uh, we do have other aspects that having nurse practitioner students and, and dental students work together would benefit patients and just looking at polypharmacy and then all the patients with uh, multiple um, medical issues that would help to kind of give them the medical uh, aspect of, of, of patient care also. 
And then when asked that whether during their education, health professional students should be involved in teamwork with students from other uh, health profession in order to understand their uh, respective roles, they all, they mostly strongly agreed with it, that this would be something helpful for them. So when looking at our, our, um, our grant, our, our hope for the future is to kind of expand our practice to not only uh, limit it to head and neck or expand the rotation. So it's not only for uh, head and neck cancer patients, but for uh, our dental patients uh, as a group, patients with uh, multiple medical issues, multiple medications, having the, the uh, fostering good relationships with uh, nursing uh, students, pharmacy students, and medical students would benefit both our students and the patients. And when it comes specifically to head and neck radiation patients, by fostering programs like we have, hopefully educating our new generations uh, of dentists and, and um, healthcare professionals to identify the need so that we can get more of that community buy-in into knowing that multidisciplinary clinical setup is needed and address the uh, disparity in the care for head and neck cancer patients. So I can take any questions about how we ran our clinic. Well, thank you so much. I'm curious. The one individual, I assume, hopefully, it was one individual who strongly disagreed with everything. And we hope that they uh, don't go into the care of head and neck patients. <laughs> so, anyway, what sort of questions do people have or comments? If I, if I may, uh, Dima, thank you for your excellent presentation. Uh, as you as you shared, you. Uh, patients with uh, oral cancer often uh, uh, result in cosmetic, functional, and psychosocial um, uh, outcomes that are, are profound. And 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 the maxillofacial prosthetic aspect is one. How do you see expanding uh, the healthcare team? I look at Developmental defects such as cleft palate, uh, mm -hmm. we often assemble the same uh, health care providers uh, in an effort to rehabilitate these uh, uh, infants and children as they mature. Absolutely. So, I mean, the Goal, our ultimate goal is always to have kind of that uh, center of excellence of patient care of being able to uh, not just address and manage the cancer, but bring them back to full function, which includes their maxillofacial prosthetics, includes speech and pathology, speech and um, swallow pathology, and being able to set up uh, a unified clinic where we, the patients can come in, they can get their dental rehabilitation, their prosthetic rehabilitation, speech uh, management, and even being able to get some of their pain management all in one uh, clinic would be uh, absolutely great for patients because most patients will tell you we can't find providers that are able to, tr to, to treat us or we can't get to the providers that are available because access to them is also very difficult. So being able to set up a center that would help us in every aspect of, of cancer patient rehabilitation would be the ultimate goal of our clinic. All right, thank you. I, 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 part of my question was, you know, who, who serves as the uh, primary provider, meaning uh, as with children, it requires an orchestration of, mm -hmm. of many uh, different uh, specialties. And, and I, I'm curious, who do you see as that person? Is it the maxillofacial prosthodontist? Yes, the maxillo, okay. which is basically my my job here at the school. Uh, I'm the one who takes over all of the maxillofacial right. prosthetic uh, rehabilitation, and I work uh, jointly with the, with the surgeons. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your work and uh, the work of your colleagues. Thank you. Our next presentation is Dr. Leah Milstein, and she'll be talking about an interprofessional training to improve advanced care planning skills of students and healthcare professionals by collaborating with oncology and palliative care champions. All right, so actually, um, hi, I am Dr. Paula Rosenblatt. I am filling in today for Dr. Milstein. Um, we co-led this project. So 
So we thank you for the opportunity to share this project and we are greatly appreciative um, of the grants for the ability um, to do this. So I am one of the medical oncologists at the school, um, school of Medicine at the University of Maryland Greenbaum Comprehensive Cancer Center. And as a medical oncologist, I have a particular um, passion about palliative care and also advanced care um, planning is obviously very um, important in our specialty. So I was um, extremely excited to join on to this project last year. So our project, again, is an interprofessional training to improve advanced care planning skills of students and healthcare professionals um, by collaborating with oncology and palliative care champions. Sorry, there we go. So um, for some background, um, only about 30% of Americans have advanced directives. And I would say that in my experience here in um, Baltimore, that we are um, significantly less. In the oncology literature in general, um, it's about 10 to 40%. Um, but there is definitely a growing emphasis on the importance of um, advanced directives and addressing end of life care and end of life goals. So here we see a, a bunch of um, the recent literature um, that is being um, read by our patients um, on this topic. Um, but we also know that there really is not a significant increase in the training of students or residents. And we even know that in practicing physicians, in a 2016 survey of um, approximately 700 physicians, um, most of suggested that there was a lack of training and they felt an uncertainty um, when addressing um, this topic. So um, a developed an excellent team of uh, faculty who is very interested in this topic. Um, so Dr. Um, Milstein and Dr. Cagle um, actually started working on this project about two years ago, and we'll go over um, the iterations of the project. Um, but they brought on um, quite an um, impressive group from the School of Nursing, um, Social Work, and Medicine. So we really appreciate um, all of our um, participants. So the objectives of our project this year um, were that it would be an interprofessional education initiative to enhance advanced care planning and communication skills from students from the schools of medicine, nursing, and social work. And again, this is building on some previous experience on this topic that I'm gonna get to in um, just a moment. And the approach um, for this year was to do a training that it would involve three modules, um, but then that patients, uh, not patients, students would have either a standardized patient experience to practice what they learned um, or a clinical experience. So the training series, again, it involved three modules um, that were about an hour and a half to two hours each. Uh, the first module ad uh, addressed advanced care planning and just kind of the basic concepts, um, the definition, the roles of each healthcare uh, member in the team, and discussions of actual cultural competency um, in this realm. And then the second module of communication at the end of life really addressed some issues of strategies of breaking, um, delivering bad news, um, discussing prognosis and empathetic communication. And in here we uh, added uh, the beginning of some role play scenarios. And the third module was um, about death and dying um, in the hospital. <laughs> of the experience would have a standardized patient that um, went over these topics and half of the students would be with clinical providers observing um, these topics um, in the clinical situation. 
So just to jump back on what the history of this project was, it actually started in 2017, 2018 um, school year and was um, funded by this interprofessional um, education um, grant in that year. And during the first iteration, Dr. Milstein noticed and uh, based off of a quality project she had previously done that advanced directives um, were not on file for um, a significant portion of the primary care clinic. I think it was, it was less than 10 percent. So in the 2017 project, the goal was for students um, to come into the primary care clinic and um, meet with a patient and get the advanced directives, um, do the conversation and documentation with the goal to increase the comfort um, in an interprofessional setting. So in 2017, to um, accomplish these goals, the, the project looked at um, three main measures. Um, the first measure was communication self-efficacy. So this was a survey that patients filled out of eight items about their ability to engage in difficult clinical conversations. And then there was the advanced care planning self-efficacy survey, which is 17 items um, on the comfort of advanced care planning. And then we use the interprofessional um, teamwork SPICE R2 survey, which is 10 questions on the Likert scale um, about working in an interprofessional team. And what we looked at was these um, three measures um, before they started the project, after their initial uh, three training sessions, and then six months post-training um, after their experience and six months post-training. So 46 students are, uh, participated in this 2017, 2018 initiative. And excitingly in 2017, they saw that all the outcomes improved. However, the project in 2017 was a bit difficult because care planning, primary care setting, with having the students um, from two specialties attend um, was um, logistically complicated and there was a very high no-show rate. So in 2018, uh, we changed the project to use standardized patients. And in this um, time frame, 36 students participated. And here you can see that um, at the six-month follow-up of the um, of the project, the ACP and the SPICE R2, I mean, the ACP and the communication self-efficacy um, measures um, had significantly um, increased. The um, interprofessional education SPICE R2 uh, remained fairly stable. So for the project of this funding year, uh, we were We got our students up with oncology and palliative care faculty, inpatient faculty, and attempt to have them shadow during a conversation geared to advanced care planning. So we use the same evaluations um, as the previous years. And we picked the same time points um, to survey the patient, and we completed the same ANOVAs um, in comparison. So for the results, um, similar to the previous year, we had 33 um, students participate. Um, however, this year we only had 15 students that completed the training, the advanced uh, care planning experience, whether that was the standardized patient or the clinical experience and their surveys. And that was due to the fact that um, we were doing much of the project uh, in February and March of 2020. So here you can see the sample characteristics of the 15 patients 
Um, they were mostly female, mostly from the School of Medicine. Um, and here you can see the measures. So unlike the other two years, um, we see that there is decrease um, in the communication and the advanced care planning self-efficacy. However, we really question any of this data um, and that due to COVID with the clinical shadowing being terminated early and with the students um, returning home to their home bases um, with a very high stress level uh, that COVID portends and the ultimately the um, difficulty in getting responses to the post surveys. Um, we don't feel that our, our experience, our data uh, fully got the, um, the best clinical situation that could have happened to, to see the results. So the prior evidence would have suggested that these interventions um, should have um, increased their communication and, and their ACP um, competencies, um, but for the circumstances make this data is incomplete and difficult to interpret. So for our next steps, um, we're considering ways that we can repeat the initiative when we're able to participate in person and when emotional distress um, is um, decreased. We're also considering if there's ways that we can do a virtual model of ACP counseling, or if there's ways that we can do role play situations um, as well. Um, exciting, we published um, in the beginning of the year, the first year's worth of data, and there was presentations of the second year data at both the Nexus, which is an interprofessional education conference, and the CSA, which is um, a Gerontology Society of America conference. And we're in the process of writing up the manuscripts for each of those. So happy to answer any questions. So thank you, Dr. Rosenblatt, for the presentation. Let's see what sort of questions there might be. So it's good to see the continual evolution of the work and one never knows during these times in terms of some of the struggles with the COVID pandemic and limited visitation, whether there might be some other opportunities to think about how do we work with those students to get them to understand this yeah. within this pandemic environment. Yeah, with some of the telemedicine abilities um, during this time, that will be at least one positive that comes out of this um, crazy time. Yeah. All right, well, thank you. All right. Um, our next presentation is being given by Dr. Doris Titus Glover, and it's about interprofessional education awareness idea for maternal opioid use disorder. So Doris has actually just froze up and is muted, so we'll see if she circles back in. There we go. Can you hear me now? We, we can hear great. Okay, wonderful. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Doris titus Lover, and I'm here to present, on behalf of my team, the Interdisciplinary Education Awareness Project for Maternal Opioid Use Disorder. I'm going to try to move the slides as I go along, and sometimes it, the keys do get stuck. Okay. So our overall aim, and uh, we like to call ourselves IDEA for MOOD, it, it, which means Interdisciplinary Education Awareness for Maternal Opioid Use Disorder. And um, our overall aim is to build a sustainable workforce of faculty, students, and health professionals will apply integrated skills and knowledge gained and um, targeted st strategies that we learn from um, one another and from the community to improve maternal and neonatal health outcomes for women who use opiate, uh, who use opiates. So um, a little bit about maternal opioid use disorder. Um, we've all heard the news um, about opioid use being on the rise. It's risen dramatically in the last 10 years, particularly prescription opioid use. 
uh, maternal opioid use has quadrupled from 1999 to 2014, and there are many reasons why. The rate of overdose, unfortunately, rose 20% in just the, um, one year and continues to rise. In 2015 to 2016, it rose 20%. Unfortunately, as well, because of the sequelae with uh, maternal opioid use during pregnancy, we have four times as many infants who were born in 2014 with neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome, which is called NAUS. Um, we used to call it NAS before. We still kind of call it NAS, but the more um, current word to use is NAUS. And this was more than in 1999. And the hospitals, um, especially with uh, Medicaid babies, are finding that there is the rise. So we know that opioid use disorder contributes to maternal neonatal morbidity and um, adverse outcomes. Um, there's a risk of preterm birth for the babies, low birth weight, respiratory and feeding problems, and then there's a risk of maternal morbidity and, and mortality as well. So um, facing all these adverse conditions that can happen, you know, pregnant women face challenges. There are medical challenges they face, the mental health challenges they face, so social challenges with stigma um, and just, you know, social determinants of health and legal issues around criminalization that can um, occur for pregnant women and parenting women. So part of our response has been um, to figure out how to treat maternal opioid use disorder in pregnant women. And we do realize that it, it, it requires integration of provider, patient, and health systems. Um, it requires fostering collaborations among intersecting disciplines for comprehensive management of pregnant women and parenting women. And I do like to add parenting women because sometimes we tend to um, forget about, you know, after the baby is born, um, the mother goes home and um, she's a new parent, also battling addiction and the new baby. Um, the other part of it that is required is capacity building um, that needs to occur so young women have residential facilities or so, um, the, the programs are available for them. There's also the surveillance and the risk identification of women who are at risk and the families who are at risk. And then we want the state and federal responses to take decisive action to reverse the trends. And, you know, that's what we look forward to. So our team is made up of seven UMB faculty members. So we're quite a large group and um, we're both faculty and clinicians. From the School of Nursing, we have Dr. Rebecca Wiseman, who's the um, Associate Professor and the Chair of the Amsung um, Shady Grove um, School University, and Catherine Fonili, who's an Assistant Professor at the School of Nursing as well. From the School of Pharmacy, we have Dr. Fadia Shire, and she's a Professor at PHSR, which is um, Pharmaceutical Health Services Research um, Department with her staff who have been very instrumental in helping to support the program, Michelle Taylor, Approva Pradam, and Nicole Silfon. And we also have um, Dr. Chris Welsh from the School of Medicine, who's been very supportive from day one, and Dr. Rebe Rebecca Viveret, who's a psychologist, who's no longer with the school, but I think she still works adjunct in the school. Um, and um, we have um, Professor Kathleen Hoke from the Curry School of Law, and from social work, we have Dr. George J. Unix. So we're quite a large group. This is a picture of all of us. I'm not gonna ask anyone to pick any of us out. So here are our objectives. So the first one would be to conduct a workshop to teach um, these integrative skills that we all need and interdisciplinary approaches for um, the evidence-based care of pregnant and parenting women with opioid use disorder. We also would like to educate professionals about stigma, uh, which we all face, enhance strength-based communication skills and facilitate and open up the discussion on ethical and legal considerations. We want to do that through talking to patients and vignettes and through case studies. We also want to develop a curriculum which is guided by recommendations and national practice standards and promote it to the UMB schools for adoption into the curriculum. And then lastly, all that we do can establish the foundation for an interdisciplinary collaborative on maternal opioid use disorder within the schools of pharmacy, medicine, nursing, and law. So we're guided by IPEC, um, IP Interprofessional Education Competencies in Healthcare. Sorry. Here, I need to bring it back. In healthcare and advances in interprofessional communication. 
And then we are also guided by um, the World Health Organization definition for interprofessional education, which states that when two or more students come together and um, learn from each other, it enables an effective collaboration and improves health outcomes. I'm going on to eight now. So to talk about objective number one, um, we were heavily engaged in um, conducting this workshop, and we, of course, had to go through the phases of getting ourselves together as a large group and planning and coordinating. And we used all the skills that we had in team building. Um, we used um, our resources within ourselves. Um, Dr. Hoke referred us to speakers. Um, Dr. Chris was also um, very supportive in referring us to um, speakers and just coming up with topics. So we used the skills within all the, the, the team to come up with um, a plan that will move us forward to conducting a workshop and to execution. And I think we, we did um, succeed at coming together even on the day of execution to do that. So what did we want to know um, from the workshop? We wanted to develop a forum that would create, we wanted to create a forum that would be for interdisciplinary cross-sector learning. We wanted to learn and wanted to learn from others and share best practices and strategies for uh, managing women with opioid use disorder. So what did we expect from our deliverables? We wanted to have at least 120 from each school, at least 14 um, members for, of our team would, would bring 14 members from each school. And then we would also have each team member promote by school. So if you're from the School of Medicine, you needed to have a big poster in your lobby, which you would you know, and then encourage your friends and faculty and, and colleagues to um, come to the workshop. We also encouraged um, collaboration to present a brown bag seminar, which I will talk about later. So we wanted a live format um, with a keynote speaker, panel of expert presentations, case studies, videos, and patient stories, because we did want to promote, um, you know, uh, the care of um, uh, pregnant and parenting women. We wanted to talk about how best to manage them and what was being done around, what were the resources that were available. We included resources in our registration packets and also offered continuing education credit. And I put the link over here because we still have information on the website that was developed for us by the communications department at the School of Nursing. So our learning outcomes were to enhance interprofessional communication and collaboration and um, identify policy implications and reporting requirements around the opioid crisis and with neonatal abstinence syndrome and maternal opioid use disorder. And then also to describe provider patient experiences with medication assisted treatment, which is the comprehensive recommended treatment for uh, women with opioid use disorder. And then also we identified available resources that would sustain continuous learning of maternal opioid use disorder. So here is our flyer that we put out. And our keynote speaker um, was Dr. Carlo Di Clemente, who's an emeritus professor of psychology at UMBC, and he was a co-developer of Trans Theoretical Model of Behavior Change and directs several programs on um, recovery and um, addiction. And we were very pleased that, you know, amongst us, we were able to um, get a referral. Professor Hoke was, Hoke was able to hook us up to him so we could um, snatch him, essentially, for the um, occasion. So just briefly, the agenda had case studies, just like I said, um, we had a keynote speech. I know it's not very clear, but um, the main highlights are the keynote speech. We had um, spotlight series on different topics, um, the criminal justice implications, um, the neonatal implications. We had a panel discussion, which was very, very um, intensive and very interesting because we had, um, I call it the case that had multiple tentacles. Um, that came from um, Dr. Welsh shared his case, and we had two OBs, medical directors on the panel, as well as a social worker. Um, we also had a psychologist and a psychiatrist on the panel. Dr. Welsh was also on the panel. So it was a very diverse group that looked at this um, case that in all implications um, touched on every aspect, including pharmacy. So that was a day's workshop, and these are some of the pictures for it, which I'll go through quickly in the interest of time. But that's um, the opening um, statement from Dr. Mary Etta Mills from the School of Nursing. And these are pictures from um, Dr. Clemente, and he was a keynote speaker, as I said. 
We also invited Dr. Polsky, who's a Calvert County Health Commissioner who came with um, his entourage from Southern Maryland. And he shared a lot of the programs which none of us had heard before, especially um, um, folks that had come from Baltimore City and Baltimore County Health Department. They were wondering why they did not know about some of Dr. Polsky's programs for recovering women. Yeah, there are more pictures. We also invited the state and they were able to share with us the impact prevention and treatment options that um, was being um, conducted to, to, to help women with opioid use disorder in the state of Maryland. And they were very gracious about sharing a lot of data and information. Um, Dr. Weisman, also in the picture, and Dr. Fadia Shire and Catherine. So those are just pictures. Yeah, I feel like it's family, so might as well share some pictures. Um, so to the outcomes and evaluations, we had over, I want to say 160 registered, and the venue was in the shock trauma um, at the hospital. So we had clinicians coming and going, but we had 160 who were, who were registered and 120 signed on to be there. There were some who didn't sign on and um, we do know that we had a lot of traffic coming and going. We had good representation from addictions and maternal health um, stakeholders. We had good representation from the schools, organizations, health departments, CMS, and from the faculty. And we conducted pre and post tests and knowledge tests and overall evaluations. And I still wanna highlight the contributions by the teams. And um, it was awesome to just to work together and collaborate on such an important topic. So um, here's a, um, a, a chart that I grabbed that I put together. It just showed that um, this is from our pretest participants. There were 96 who filled out the pretest, and you can see that uh, most of the students came from nursing, social work, public health, and um, a few were scattered around. We did have quite a bit of medicine, but not as much. Um, so we were pleased to take, you know, just about everybody was represented over there. Um, we also looked at, you know, the educational background. We did expect to see a lot of um, um, advanced degree level participants, and the master's degree was the highest level that showed up in our um, in our chart. And this was with the pretest that was an N of 86. The 86 participants filled this one out. And this one is about how many students were present, how many were not students, how many were practicing and line service providers. So um, there were fewer students, uh, more who said they were not students. And then we also had a, a, an even distribution of those who were practicing line service providers and then PhDs and MDs. So we asked them questions on the pretest about their knowledge. Uh, about the care of women and also about the care of infants and um, NAS, and also the knowledge of specialized services for women. And you can see on the right hand corner that, you know, about 42, 44% said they had good knowledge about it, somewhat good knowledge about it, but it was still less than we would expect, less than 50%. And then there was about a third to 40% who said they have very poor knowledge about it. We also asked about their confidence levels, and you see that even drops. The confidence level drops as to um, what exactly um, people can do. We asked if they would rate their willingness to participate in uh, interdisciplinary teams and collaborate with others, and that was very high, so that was very important. So now uh, we looked at the post-test, and you can see that basically um, the knowledge doubled both for care of women and for infants and for specialized services. Um, the confidence level also went up, um, 69%, and um, the willingness now to collaborate went even higher to 97%. And then also importantly, we asked them if they had gained useful information about comprehensive care for substance use in women or infants with NAS at today's workshop. And look at that, it was 92% said yes, they had gained a lot of knowledge. And then we also asked them if they would incorporate that information about substance using women or infants with NAS from today's workshop into their professional practice. And it was a high of 85. So we were very pleased with the workshop. Um, here are some comments that were left by some, some of the participants, that they enjoyed being with other disciplines to begin the process of collaboration. 
And the Nikki Ness said what she learned today, she would apply towards caring for her babies and to please continue with an interdisciplinary approach. Um, the patient's words matter, stigma, everyone is equal, will know how to meet each patient at their need. And then the understanding that substance use is a, is a chronic, is an actual chronic disease, was some of what was shared by um, participants. So the spin-off to that is um, we put together a white paper from the summary of the workshop, which is under review with our publishers right now, and would likely be published by the end of the year. We got calls about interviews, which we did, we did with the Washington Post, uh, Women's Magazine, the Lilly, um, University of Maryland, Alumni Association, Super, Super Majority News, and even with Fox 45 and Straight Talk. And then I think because of the workshop, it's end as representation on Maryland Maternal Mortality Review Stakeholders Group. So a lot of work went into the workshop, and it was our first real effort um, in achieving objective number one. Our second objective was to educate professionals about stigma and enhance communication skills and open up the discussion about, you know, the ethical issues. So we conducted two brown bags um, in 2019, um, one on neonatal, neonatal abstinence syndrome, coordinated care, and the role of social determinants in treating maternal opioid disorder. And the second one was interdisciplinary care models to address the stigma of opioid use disorder in pregnancy. And they were presented by, the first one was presented by Jamie Sridlikowski, who's our nurse midwife and um, nurse practitioner, and Kathleen Hoke, who's our professor in law and um, a wealth of knowledge when it comes to um, criminal issues and legal legalities around pregnant women with opioid use disorder. We had the, the brown bag was conducted in the School of Nursing, one of the conference rooms, and participation was around 28 people, um, folks from faculty and students from the School of Medicine, social work, nursing, pharmacy, and law. And then with the second brown bag, we had about 20 participants in the classroom um, format. Uh, mind you, it's a brown bag, so bring your lunch for one hour. We had clinicians, faculty, students from School of Medicine, Social Work and Nursing and Pharmacy. And um, it was presented by Dr. Shire and Dr. Unik from Social Work and um, some of it myself. So objective number three was to develop a curriculum guided by practice standards and national recommendations. And we developed a model, um, eight models, with seven core topics and one interdisciplinary communication topic. And we have been promoting it um, as much as we can to schools and nurse and pharmacy and social work and anybody basically who would listen. Now we have challenges with the curriculum because of course we have to have buy-in. And then, you know, um, it's different for every discipline. Some want it ready to use, some would like to use it as continued outreach, um, some would just like a bare bones framework. But um, we have thought long and hard about this, and based on lessons learned, we think maybe, you know, some of the models could be used for interdisciplinary brown bags. Um, we could develop a curriculum with videos, reflection points, and case studies, and adapt sort of a panel approach towards a, a, and a case-oriented approach towards working through the models and the different topics. And then we can also create professional development learning activities for continued education. So there's a whole gamut of things that we could do with some funding. So let's go to objective number four, and that would be setting up, um, establishing the foundation for an interdisciplinary collaborative. And we feel like we've already done that or we're on the way to achieving that pretty well. We have a curriculum to promote that identifies options to sustain interprofessional continuous learning. Um, it has the potential for creating, we have the potential for creating a learning management system. We did ask our workshop participants if they would like to be contacted about um, future webinars and um, future sharing that they may be interested in, and they all agree that they would be interested. So I feel like a learning management system, or we think a learning management system is not out of our reach. Um, for an educational event. We have representation in five out of seven schools, and uh, we, I know that School of Dentistry has been interested in joining us, and we would be interested in opening it up to public health as well. We've developed a white paper for students, faculty, clinicians, and um, you know, um, a point of um, resource for anyone who is interested in learning more. 
we develop networking opportunities and community partnership. And one great partnership that evolved from um, the workshop was um, we met with the community uh, partner who is actually partnering right now with us on proposals. And she was a great speaker in helping us understand collaborations within the community. And then, of course, we maintain interdisciplinary collaboration status because we have been calling on each other and um, just collaborating on proposals. This, will, I think, will be collaborating on our second or third um, proposal this year. So um, we have set the foundation and we have um, achieved a lot of the goals that and most of the goals that we set out in the proposal. So our short-term outcomes would be to provide a forum for interdisciplinary cross-sector learning, which we did. We provided opportunities for sharing best practice, which we did. We identified strategies and common areas for collaboration. And then our long-term goals are still um, team-based skills, which take a long time to develop, but we worked our way through it. We shared our individual experiences and we are fostering professional relationships and collaboration building. So we're hoping that with this information, we're able to go out and um, um, promote the care of and the management of pregnant and parenting women with opioid use disorder. This is um, a video that Dr. Unik used during the workshop, which is pretty good. And if anyone's interested, I can post it into the chat box. And then with that, um, if any of my team is there, would like to say a few words for a second or two. Um, I would just like to um, thank the university for um, providing us with the funding um, to allow us to bring our team together to work on this very in important topic. So um, thank you for the um, support that we received. You're welcome. Anyone else? We're deeply, deeply, deeply grateful for the funding from the Center for Interprofessional Education, and we hope that your generosity will continue, and we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for making this opportunity possible for us. Thank you. And Doris, if there are folks on the call who want to become a part of the collaborative, would they reach out to you? Yes, they would want to reach out to me. and. Uh, my email is pretty um, easy. It's dtitlesglover at umaryland.edu, and I can put it in the chat box. Very good. Well, thank you so much for this work. Obviously, uh, when you were starting this work, we weren't in the pandemic, and so there was a lot of attention paid to the opioid issues, and we'll come out the other side at some point and need to focus on it again, because clearly it's, a, it's not a short-term issue for our country, and we Appreciate the relationships you're building and the work that you hope to do in the future as well as what you've done to date. Thank you. Our, our final presentation will be uh, given by Christopher Adamo. I think I might have gotten it close, I apologize. And it's on the development of an interprofessional culinary health and medicine elective. So I'm Dr. Dr. Didamo. He was part of the project, but I'm Dr. Heineck, and I'll be presenting. I don't think I did see him on the call, but I did see um, Dr. Rambob as well. So I will see if I can share my PowerPoint. Okay, good. All right. Can everybody see that? Yes, we can see it. Thank you. Fantastic. I just changed it to presentation mode. So I just wanted to start out by saying thank you, Dean Kirschling, and thank you to the, the Center for Interprofessional Education for the funding that allowed us to help develop this, this course. So I'll be talking about the creation of an interprofessional um, culinary health and medicine elective. Um, and so this was a collaboration between Dr. Dadamo, he's in the School of Medicine, um, myself, I'm in the School of Pharmacy, and Dr. Rambob, who's in the School of Dentistry. Um, and just a little bit of background. Um, so a few years ago, I had done an integrative medicine intensive through the School of Medicine. And then that summer, there was a very large inter, um, integrative medicine conference that took place in Baltimore. And I was lucky enough to attend a few sessions on culinary health and medicine. And all of the presenters were from schools of medicine and they were all 
um, opportunities within within medical education and specifically medical schools to provide additional information on really nutrition and, and culinary health. Um, and I, I have always loved cooking and it seemed like a really fun and excellent opportunity to, to bring students from other schools together to talk about um, this important topic. Just a little bit of, of background about where the idea uh, came from. There's already quite a few established examples of this within the, the medical education. So I'll give you a little bit of an overview of our course. And if you are taking a look at that picture in the lower right hand corner, that is the beautiful space, our teaching kitchen that we were able to conduct the course in. It's located in Harbor East. Um, and we're very grateful for the, um, I always mess up their name, um, but it's uh, it'd be the Institute for Integrative Health um, that, that allowed us to use their space and actually provided some instructors to help in the teaching. So that is, that is our lovely space and I will show you some more pictures later. But the course was a one credit pass sale course that was reviewed and approved by the curriculum committee at the School of Pharmacy. And I saw Dr. Congdon on this call, who is our, our esteemed chair of that committee and is um, pretty familiar with this course. So our outcomes for the course were fourfold. The first was to compare, contrast, and be familiar with the evidence surrounding popular diets and dietary trends. Second was to describe how nutrition education can be included in numerous clinical settings that may contain a variety of healthcare providers. The third was to identify ways to overcome nutrition barriers of limited time, financial resources, and taste. And finally, to implement an interprofessional approach to healthy nutrition. So the course was structured into five workshops, a community outreach project, and two assignments. So the two assignments, the first was related to that community outreach project and included a reflection paper reflecting on the, um, the interprofessional nature of that community outreach project, the community that they were working within, and then um, at anything, anything else that they wanted to include. So that was the first assignment. The second assignment was that the students would take either a family or favorite recipe and modify it using what they had learned during the course so that our final, our final uh, time together um, included sort of a, a potluck where students brought these different dishes and it was just a real really nice well it was it was meant to be a nice opportunity for us to learn a bit about different cultures um, and different recipes and um, that ended up happening in the midst of COVID so we did it virtually and, and didn't get the opportunity to, to try those different dishes but it was it was still um, very interesting to hear about the, the different modifications the students made and then we also conducted a pre and post survey and the pre and post survey was aimed to um, look at, at both their experience working with other healthcare professionals um, to, to be able to better understand how our course was able to, to facilitate interprofessional understanding and collaboration. And then we also wanted to understand how the course was impacting their nutrition knowledge and their ability to take that into their, their clinical practice upon graduation. So um, this is a little bit about the workshop flow. So the workshops, there were a total of five workshops. The, the final one was really um, not in, in this sort of format. It was that recipe sharing opportunity. Um, so the, the first four, there was 30 minutes of didactic lecture focused on, we really focused on three specific popular diets. Those included a um, paleo diet, Mediterranean diet, and uh, really a vegetarian diet. The very first workshop was really focused on, on just general nutrition and barriers to education to sort of set the foundation for those remaining um, workshops. The next hour was um, an opportunity to cook within their groups, and these were inter, um, interprofessional groups, so students from multiple different schools cooking together, and every, uh, every session we changed up those groups, so students had a, a really nice opportunity to get to know um, multiple students from other schools. And then the final 30 minutes together, we had an opportunity to eat together and to have a culinary conversation about other questions related to the, to the diet we may have talked about that week, other uh, questions related to interprofessional um, questions, and, and whatever multiple things came up during our, our culinary conversation. So a little bit about how those workshops flowed. So the community outreach project was intended to be a component. Unfortunately, because of COVID, we um, were not able to complete the community outreach project. There were a lot of limitations 
um, that COVID kind of uh, it imposed. As I'm, I'm not sure. I wasn't able to to be here for the other presentations to hear if COVID impacted their their projects. Um, but we were not able to to complete the community outreach component. The plan for the project was that there would be groups of five students um, working together. They would uh, have a particular site that they were working with. The first step was to complete a needs assessment to better understand what the nutrition needs of that particular community were. Um, after they conducted the needs assessment, they would develop a project and complete a project description. And then they would implement that project in coordination with the instructors. And then I already talked about the reflection paper. So we did have to pivot in the middle of COVID um, and, and we were not able again to, to complete this as, as part of the project. So I'll talk a little bit about our results from, from our first course offering. So there were a total of 24 students who participated. We had room for tw a total of 25. Again, we were limited by the number of students we could admit by virtue of the, the teaching kitchen space. It is a lovely space, but it is you know, limited in terms of the number of, of students who can participate. Um, so there, uh, of those 24 students, there was representation from pharmacy, medicine, um, dental and law. Um, and I, I'm not sure if this means that the pharmacy students really liked me or I did a good job advertising, but we did end up with, with a pretty significant um, number of, of pharmacy students who participated. I want to share a little bit about um, our survey results with you all. So these are some results from our pre-course survey. So we wanted to get a better understanding of our audience in terms of what prior nutrition education that they had. So our, our question for them was, have they had any formal or informal nutrition education? Um, and you can see the results here. About a third of the students said that they had no nutrition education, 20% had informal nutrition education, and about 40% had formal nutrition education. Now, what was interesting is we asked them to provide additional details about this education training. Um, and there was a lot of variability. So obviously they're all um, you know, in professional schools and there's some degree of nutrition that's likely in their curriculum. So some students considered that formal nutrition education, others said they had no formal nutrition education. So um, I, I'm not sure that this question necessarily speaks to, to the degree of, of prior nutrition education. Um, I think I remember one response that had said they had formal nutrition education, but it was from high school. Um, and so it, it was just interesting to see the, the interpretation of this particular um, question. We also asked students if they had experience working with um, students in other healthcare professions. And not surprisingly, the majority had had some experience, 83%, but we did have a small chunk who had not had that opportunity um, be before. So now I'll present a little of the pre and post course survey results. I think it's really interesting to see some of the changes in, in some of these particular questions that we asked. So one of the questions that we asked was, I feel confident in my knowledge about the roles of other healthcare professional students. So I will um, just first point out that the number of respondents for our pre-survey was 23, whereas our post-survey was nine. Um, so, um, our, our post survey had a significantly lower lower number of respondents. I'm not sure if that was um, because of COVID, if it was because it was the end of the semester and everybody was busy with finals um, and the survey kind of fell to the, the bottom of their pile, but we did have a, a pretty low um, response rate for the post survey. Um, so I'll focus a little bit more on the percentages than the absolute number. Um, so we, we asked, you know, again, how, how confident they felt in their knowledge. Um, and we used a five point Likert scale. So I'll use the three responses that the students provided with us. There were some that had received no responses. So um, before the, before the, the course, 40% felt confident, 56% felt somewhat confident and 4% one student felt not confident. Um, so in our post survey results, again, um, a much smaller number of students who participated, but we had no students who did not feel confident. A third felt somewhat confident, and, and our confident number increased to 66%. So I think there was um, a lot of informal opportunity during the course for students to better talk with each other um, and, and explain not only their roles, but, but also their education. So I think there was a lot of opportunities, again, for a lot of informal conversations. Um, another question that I wanted to share with you is how prepared do you feel you are to provide healthy eating recommendations to patients 
friends or family members. Um, and so, again, looking at our pre versus our post survey, again, this is a five point Likert scale. I've reported out the, um, the responses that students selected. Uh, there were about 18% that felt very prepared before the course, 17% felt prepared, um, and 74% felt somewhat prepared. So I think our post results are pretty telling. There's none that said somewhat pre prepared, 62% felt prepared, and now 38% felt very prepared. So I think, you know, in terms of their, their um, feeling confident in providing some of these recommendations, um, the, the course really provided them with, with additional confidence in their knowledge. Sorry, I have, I have a very rude coworker. I'm lucky that the nine-year-old and five-year-old haven't walked in yet, so my, my apologies. All right, so moving right along. Um, uh, the next question I wanted to share was, how would you rate your knowledge of clinical evidence, practical application, and misconceptions surrounding popular diets? Again, another, another five-point Likert scale that we used. Um, and before the, the course, 13% felt knowledgeable, about 44% felt somewhat knowledgeable, and again, 44% felt not knowledgeable. After the, the course, we had a huge change in terms of the number of, of um, students who really felt like they had grown in their knowledge with 92% feeling knowledgeable um, and 1% feel, or one, one student 8% feeling somewhat knowledgeable. So I think the, the education that was provided really um, helped the students feel uh, more confident in, in their knowledge around, um, around popular diet. Um, I think this might be the final question that I have to share with you from our survey, which was how prepared do you feel um, you are to help patients overcome the following five common barriers to healthy eating. Um, so those barriers were lack of patient confidence and ability to prepare healthy foods, unwillingness to give up unhealthy foods that the patient craves, belief that eating healthy on a budget is impossible, and perception, perception of insufficient time to eat healthy, and then finally flavor enhancement without excessive sugar. Um, or salt. And this was a scale of, of one to five that the students were, were rating it on, um, with five being feeling more prepared um, and one feeling, feeling very unprepared. So the way I've presented this is the mean score that students purported, pr reported both before the course and then after the course. And you can see that the majority of the students were somewhere between a two and a three in their pre-course um, feeling prepared. And after the course, those all increase to, to closer to four, um, up to five for some students. So students felt a lot more prepared to address some of these, these common barriers to healthy eating. And I would even venture to say that they maybe even felt like they were able to overcome them for themselves. Um, because I think oftentimes, you know, our students have a lot going on. So these are even barriers, not just within, within patients they might um, be working on, but even, even within themselves in terms of healthy eating. Um, so that's all the data that I had to present. I did want to give um, a, a big shout out, a big thank you to some people who this course could not have happened without. So on the right hand side, that's Christine Barnabet. Christine um, works with Dr. Didamo in um, all the different integrative um, medicine things that are happening in the School of Medicine. She also works with HR Wellness. Um, so you, I don't know if anyone's participated in that, but she does some guided meditation. Um, and I know she's done some yoga and probably other things that I'm unaware of. So we could definitely not have done this without Christine's amazing organization and, and uh, coordination. Um, I've, I've made a lot of grocery lists for myself, but I've never made a grocery list for a course before. So Christine helped to make sure that we weren't um, missing any details. And then on the left-hand side, this is Brandon and Nicola. Um, Brandon and Nicola are two employees at that uh, Institute for Integrative Health. Um, and they were instructors um, teaching our students knife skills. And, um, and you would be surprised how difficult it is to cook and explain what you're doing at the same time. Um, I recently tried and I think I failed. I added my ingredients in all the wrong order. I, it didn't help that I had my five-year-old on my back the whole time. Um, but these two are very talented in being able to, to teach that cooking aspect of things. Um, and then these are just some more pictures of our students who participated. These are um, in the, the top center photo. This is an example of the cooking station. Um, there was a huge amount of time involved in getting everything set up. So um, this course was a, a real labor of love, I would say, in terms of um, making everything happen. 
Um, but I think it was it was overall really successful and we're excited to continue it in the spring of 2021. It will be virtual, um, but excited to, to continue. And at this point, if anybody has any questions, I would um, love to answer them. And I, I know that I saw Dr. Rambob on the call. So um, Dr. Rambob, if there's anything else that um, you would like to, to add, and if I miss Dr. Dadamo or Christine, if you guys have anything to add to, love, love to have you guys um, speak a little bit too. Hello everyone, this is Isabel Rambab. Laura did a fantastic job presenting. So I think you cover all the bases and I just want to reserve some more time for questions. Thank you everyone. So let's see what sort of questions there are. And without a doubt, I'd like to know what you're cooking for dinner. <laughs> well, you can see I have an Amazon delivery. Um, that's a good question. You know, it's, my kids have gotten a lot better at cooking during, during the pandemic and being from home. I think tonight might be some turkey meatballs um, and roasted bro broccoli. So, yeah, ah. I should have everybody from the group over for dinner when, when this resolves. You mentioned that the, the workshop would be a didactic lecture about one of the popular diets and then, and then you would cook. Would, would you cook based on that diet? Yes, the recipes that we cooked were based on that diet. Um, and we, before the course started, we did do, uh, we found out about dietary restrictions as well. So we were always prepared with, with um, any dietary restrictions um, during the course. So yes, the recipes were, which was another, another process in and it of itself, finding the right recipes that were in the, the vein of, of that, um, that diet and then were within our time constraints. So we always had three items that were part of the meal. There was always a dessert. A main course and some kind of an appetizer or side. So um, I have developed a whole new skill set to put together the, the items needed um, for for this this course. But it was it was really so much fun to put together. Lauren, this is Heather. Um, I am super excited about the course. I have to tell you that at our interprofessional clinic that we have, we have we had historically had pharmacy, nursing, and social work students, and we were seeing patients with uncontrolled diabetes in an underserved population with um, un uh, uninsured, um, underserved, low income. And so, you know, we were working with these patients with diabetes and chronic disease management and so forth, and all they wanted to know was, what are we able to eat? And so this would have been a perfect course for students that then come to our um, clinic because, you know, we are trying to educate um, our patients on what to eat. We've been fortunate to actually have dietetic students join our team because it was such an important need. Um, but I think, you know, when you're talking, especially about a lot of a lot of chronic disease management on these interprofessional teams, having that knowledge and the nutritional side is really important. So I think this sounds great. Heather, we'll have to connect on that community outreach component because um, that was, you know, we, um, we, are, we were looking for additional sites as well um, for opportunities for students to go out where there was a, a need. So we were working with Ashley Valais in the community, um, the uh, community outreach center close to, to the, the, um, the campus. Um, and we're really excited to do some different uh, educational things within the community. I think there's, there's a, a real need and interest. I know in, in the patient population that, that I see, I frequently come across people who just don't have any cooking skills. So it's not even like you don't understand what might be healthy versus what uh, it's unhealthy, but they've just never been taught kind of what those skills are to even be able to, to um, kind of start, start preparing a, a healthy meal. Um, and, you know, there's um, Hungry Harvest that comes to the Community Engagement Center um, with the $8 bags of produce. And so we were hoping to even partner with them. A lot of times they put recipes with their particular boxes um, of produce. But again, if, if people don't have the, the skills to be able to then understand, well, and then we get into a whole lot of barriers with, okay, what do they have in their home? Do they have a stove? Do they have a, um, you know, what, what kind of cooking um, utensils are, are they having? What access do they have to that? So it opens up a whole lot of uh, other discussion points, I think, and and complications, but um, yeah, thank you for that, Heather. That was kind of our idea, that there really is so much nutrition that goes into so many of our, our chronic disease state management. So let's see if there's any other questions or comments. 
So to all of you, congratulations on a job well done. It's always fun for us to see the results of the small funding that we provide and to see how um, each of you approaches the interprofessional education component. Um, I don't know if Dr. Cognon or Dr. Mar Martinez want to say anything. I'd just like to say this was my, my first time attending this and I was really inspired by the incredible array of projects that, that everybody put together and um, just really inspired to, to face the next year, even in the midst of this pandemic, uh, and see what sort of what sort of projects all the wonderful people on this campus come up with for the next year. I would echo what Joe said. You know, very impressive all around, and can't wait to hear what you how you guys are able to continue these projects both in the coming semester with COVID and also when we get back on campus someday. So everyone, we thank you. We wish you the best. Stay safe, stay well, stay sane, and continue the great work and reach out to us and continue to ask us for funding. So have a good evening.